Um, we've got a great panel. What I'd like to do first is to invite uh, Tim Cavill to come up and join us. Tim Cavill is the uh, Regional Managing Director for uh, BT Services in the region. I've actually known Tim, I think, for, wow, maybe 30 years. We used to, we used to work at SAP together. And um, Tim's got incredibly high EQ. He's led sales teams. Uh, but he's also, as a managing director, has salespeople actually interact with him. So I think Tim uh, is going to do an absolutely brilliant job of giving us both sides of the coin. And I've, um, you know, I've seen Tim operate under huge pressure, inspires teams. I think great leaders really protect their people from a lot of the stuff that comes down from the top. Uh, so I think Tim can give us a really, really good perspective. And then the uh, other person we're going to have on the panel, because uh, unfortunately Tim Epic was unable to join us. He was called overseas at the last minute, but we've got someone better, I think, in the context of this talk. And that's actually, and that's actually Steve Ludlow from Harlow Group. And Steve's the managing director of Harlow Group. Thank you, mate. I'll, I'll pay you later, or you can pay me. Um, uh, all all uh, this business does is hire senior sales leaders and sales people. So this is really their specialty. Um, so ho hopefully you've got some, some questions to hand. What I thought I'd do just to really kick things off to ask a question of the panel is um, uh, how do you really define EQ and what are the EQ traits that you rate most highly? Um, and Tim, if it's okay, I might actually start with you. Yeah, sure, Tony, thank you. Um, you know, and firstly, 20 pages of notes I took, uh, Kian, so that's, um, that, that's pretty good uh, in uh, 45 minutes. Um, so, uh, Tony, hiring's hard, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I've been doing it for how many years, and, and I still think it's, you know, it's hit and miss. Um, but the things that we're focusing on now, the things we're trying, you know, get it right more times than getting it wrong. Um, when we, when we look for people to come and join, the, join our business, we talk about cultural fit, but, but what really is that? Um, you know, what is cultural fit? Um, and how do you assess it in the interviewing process? Um, and so we spend a bit of time on that now, and typically what that means kind of manifests in different ways, but um, typically our, and it doesn't really matter what the role is, um, we look for a lot of peer review um, and I've, I've found you know through social media or whatever that the, the market is so small um, that pretty much anyone going for any role you can triangulate um, so we use a lot of triangulation you know what is what has this person been like what's their success um, in, in other companies and other markets um, so a lot of triangulation um, and, and you spoke about why we win, um, and you know I thought that was fantastic. Actually, it was it was just it was really good. Um, and we try and link through that hiring process. We try and get through to that person that their success I is intrinsically linked, inverted commas, to to our success. So kind of the lens when someone comes in, we're saying, you know, I'm going to rely on this person to make our business successful, regardless of what role they're in. And so the dimension is, you know, can I, can I trust you to do your job, whether it's a finance job, whether it's an admin job, a sales job, pre-sales job. We need to have confidence that that person is going to perform, do their job, be successful, and in turn, kind of our success rests on that. So we spend a lot of time kind of drilling into that, and uh, to be frank, uh, today it's it's peer review and what I call triangulation. Kim, what, what are you seeing with companies out there in how they try and get to the real EQ of a, a person in their team? Because assessing skills, qualifications, experience is pretty easy, mm. but, but, but identifying cultural fit, I guess EQ is a big part of that, but not all of it. How are you seeing companies approach that? Um, I would say sporadically. Um, I'm not seeing it being done as a, um, as a sort of a consistent step in every recruiting process. I was talking to someone recently um, and they were saying that if they, certainly for a senior role, if they get um, one or two people that they're very, very interested in, one of the things they'll do is actually um, take them out for lunch mm. and then see how they interact with the waiters and see how they interact with you know, other people. Watch them in an environment where they're not necessarily going to be as sort of um, uh, maybe aware of their behavior and they, you know, they'll default to their more natural tendencies. Um, because 
how you treat people is, is, is of critical importance in every situation. And I remember being interviewed um, for one of my prior roles and there were two people interviewing me and one of them decided he was going to do the bad cop and the other the good cop. And that was, as I discovered later, about seeing how I reacted under pressure and when someone got a, you know, a little bit, he wasn't, he wasn't throwing punches, but he was certainly getting a little bit um, aggressive and seeing how I responded. And, and that was, uh, from their perspective, a mechanism because they recognized that the role I would be going into was high stress and might have situations where that was, you know, was something that you would need to be able to deal with. So how do you handle it under pressure? So I think I, I've only seen it in an ad hoc sense, but definitely people are getting much more aware of that now. And to Tim's point, the peer review piece is critical. I get calls all the time from people saying, you know, this person, yes or no. And, you know, and that's pretty extraordinary where they would do that, but they will base that on your knowledge of someone and, you know, would you hire them? And, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, I find the same thing in the market as well. Um, uh, Steve, I'd really be interested in your view. This, this is all you do. So do you yep. find many employers have the right level of focus on EQ, cultural fit at the front end of the process? And how do you try and embed that into the way that you filter out and get the very best people for roles? To answer your first question, I, I don't think they're primarily in the first stage of the recruitment process. There's a lack of focus on it. Uh, there's, there's an acute focus on proven skills in my industry and, and those sorts of things. And that limits a lot of employers to a very small group of individuals that may or may not be high on EQ at all uh, because they haven't screened in the first instance based on those factors. Uh, and in some instances, depending on the recruiter that they're working with or, or whoever they're working with, whether or not they've been challenged on that, um, will determine whether or not they've got a, a large enough pool of talent available to them to actually be able to um, measure things like EQ and, and some of those softer skills. Mm. Um, in terms of you know, how we're measuring it in our business, um, and how we're encouraging our clients to do it is number one, to, to open your mind in terms of other industry sectors that aren't exactly what you do to, to be able to have the affordability to, to measure that in the first place. So as you're not measuring the best of three people. Um, and, and number two is to, I look at emotional intelligence in the sales process very much about understanding the customer. And to your point, um, Kian, um, it, it's all about understanding the customer and that comes from empathy but it also comes from something I, I like to call commercial curiosity. So when you have a, a salesperson in front of a customer, um, their ability to genuinely and innately be interested in how to um, take advantage of that opportunity for the customer to get revenue uplift or help them manage risk. But ultimately, it's about understanding the client and to measure that throughout a process. Yes, there's assessments and all those sorts of things with Thomas International and so forth, but I find the most useful way to do it is interpret the questions that the candidate's asking and the rapport they build with you in the interview um, and try not to be too officious in your uh, interview process. Mm. There might be a time for that with the good cop, bad cop, as Ken said, mm. but I think it's critical to give them a space to be able to build rapport with you, ask questions and ask yourself the question as the interviewer, have they understood my business as they've walked out the door? or they really just answered my questions and talked at me. Mm. Um, and, and I think you're looking for that interview to be reflective of a sales process, and you're looking for the behaviours in the interview that you're looking for in a sales process to come out. And that's the commercial curiosity, the questions, and not the pre-scripted questions, the innately curious ones where they keep digging until they understand that they connect with something, and then find something about their background that connects with what it is you're looking for as a sales leader. That's what you're asking the salespeople to do on the field, that's what you want them to do in the interview. Well, can I pick up on that? Because um, we, we call it professional curiosity. But I, yep, same but thing. I, yeah. But I, I think it is the single biggest <laughs> trait yeah. that, that actually dictates career success. And, and that's one of the things that we try and look for. And, you know, you talk, talk to it about, you know, manifests in different ways, whether it's attitude or whether it's critical thinking. But that professional curiosity, mm. I think that is, is absolutely key. And, and another way that you can measure that is by creating a, a role play scenario as your final interview to, to really test how they might perform out there on the field. Don't hire somebody and find out three weeks in they're the wrong person. Because yep. you've seen them on the field and they're, they're not a culture fit. Give them an opportunity to, at the final step of the process, if you've narrowed it to, to, to the top two, create a role play scenario that's not about pitching a service, but maybe it's a discovery call. It, it's the first part of the sales process. I think that indicates sales yeah. capability and EQ yeah. more than you know, asking them to close you yeah. on, on a deal because the deal's closed 
um, long before it's uh, yep. you're trying to close a customer. It's about their ability to understand the needs, and that's where you get the opportunity to measure the commercial curiosity. That's brilliant. How about we move to questions from the floor? John's got a microphone, so if you'd like to ask a question, uh, could we have a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi there, Simon Harrop. I'm, I'm quite interested in the win-loss review um, from, from all of the panel because it's something that is definitely underdone. Who are the best people to do it and what's the right forum and format to do it? Can I just jump in with a comment sure. on this? Um, I'm doing a kickoff for an Australian publicly listed company next week and I met with their sales director yesterday just to get briefed for my keynote and he said to me that they, they do loss reviews and the number one reason they lose deals is price. And I said to him, all of the research says that that's not the case. And I showed him some research. Kean's research shows that's the case. I showed him corporate executive board research. And I said, um, I said, who does your loss reviews? And what do you think the answer was? The sales rep. So uh, it was re really quite interesting. So uh, Kean, we'll start with yeah, you. Yeah, look, uh, my, my advice is if you're, if you're not doing it and you want to do it and um, you, you, know, you don't have a budget or a business case, get someone to do it internally, but make that a third party internally. Um, because you, you need to create some separation um, if you want to really get candid feedback. So if you're really serious about it, you want to create an environment where the customer is comfortable sharing. And if they're talking to someone that they engage with through the sales process or someone that individual reported to, it makes it incredibly hard for them to do that. But in addition, it makes it incredibly hard for those individuals to then do anything with that information internally because of you, you, you know the, the politics of an organization because of a whole lot of other things. So what my advice would be, and I hope it's not sounding too self-serving, is do it internally rather than not doing it at all, but get a third party. You know, why we have a business and why we've had a business for this amount of time is that um, a lot of companies see value in getting a third party to come in, have that conversation, because it does two things. It allows us to really, really get to the heart of the issue, but then it allows us to actually do something with that feedback and use it to help drive transformation back into their business rather than it being, okay, well, we now have this hot potato, what do we do with it? So, so I think definitely do it and do it yourself versus not doing it at all, but you could consider you know, um, looking outside the organization as well if you want to create an environment where you're going to do this ongoing. I personally think it's, it's the last step in the sales process, and I think it's, it's one that if you've done a halfway decent job, you've earned the right to the feedback, yeah. most of the time we leave it sitting on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a job title within the organization you'd suggest that that might be best managed by? If you're going to try and do it internally, is it more of an analytical skill set? Someone in finance you might ask to do it? Or I've, I've seen people in operations do a pretty good job. I've seen people in marketing try it, but they tend to have maybe a slight bias towards yeah. the marketing side. So ops would be probably the, uh, you know, the best place if you're going to do it internally. Okay. Yeah. If I think of our context, <laughs> the two guys who typically do it are our CFO or COO. Yeah. Um, so they're senior enough in the organization. They can relate to the customer and say, hey, look, we spent a lot of time here. Um, we want to learn from it, yep. um, so the customer normally reacts pretty well to that. Yep. But you know, I think most companies, ourselves included, are room for improvement in terms of you know how regularly you do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and my feedback is it can't be the salespeople. Yep. Um, but there's but there's one question you should ask in win reviews that is absolute gold, and very few people ask it. And the question is, what happened inside your organisation that started you down the path where you ended up buying something like this? And what that does is that tells you how to go and identify trigger events and pipeline in the marketplace <laughs> and what content you need to create to attract people early. So that's how you'll help people engage, engage strategically is understand what triggers them starting their own journey way back in the process even before they build a business case. Correct. A question here. Uh, hi, Jeremy Pyatt from Shipley Asia Pacific. Nice to see so many of our customers here today, folks. Catch you later. Um, firstly, Ken, congratulations. I, I think what you've identified as something we've picked up over the years is that very low percentage of people do those loss reviews, let alone the win reviews, and absolutely support what you're saying there about don't get your sales folks to do it. And only other thought on that is if, if you're going to have a CFO or a COO, make sure they themselves have been tested and have relatively high EQ as well because that's what actually makes for a good review. Um, an, an observation and then a question. The observation is that in our business we found over the years that the EQ cultural fit cuts both ways. One of the things we're really enjoying about um, expressing it more fully in a, in a, as a kind of a bilateral idea is that we walk away from a lot of customers where we don't think there's a cultural fit these days because what we do has to work at such high levels mm. in the organisation. If we don't align, there's no point taking money when we know it's just not going to work. So don't be afraid to use it as a filter both ways. Yeah. Um, question. 
which follows on from that. Uh, I'll, I'll just get a sh if I could just get a show of hands, who in the room here is a practitioner in sales and, uh, uh, and, and kind of operates in that space? Just to make sure we understand the question. Who in your organisation owns and can direct and control the sales process for others? Okay. So the question is about the latter group and for the others. Um, how have you uh, here on the panel found you've gone where you may have an individual walks out of here today, fired up about EQ, thinks it's the greatest thing out, walks back into their organisation and the people who own, run and control the process don't get it, don't buy it, don't have EQ and the process is actually working against themselves. Yep. What's the advice for that? Because we see that a lot and I'd love to hear how you folk would guide someone on that one. Um, I might just quickly jump in and then hand over to Tim. So I got back from <coughs> South Africa yes yesterday, I think it was, the day before, um, and I've spent three days with a really great group of... Um, young um, sales professionals from throughout Africa. And we covered a lot of stuff. And one of the questions asked is, how do we now do this? We go back into our, into our day jobs and the people around us haven't been exposed to these new ideas and these new insights. And you know, we, we may well get pushback. And, and my advice is, take, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Take, take small chunks. And what you'll start to see is, as you accumulate some wins and some su success, others will come to you. If you try and force an agenda down other people's throats, invariably you'll get pushed back and you'll get all these other things. If you just quietly go about your business and do these things and make those changes and start to see the results, everyone else will look at you and try and understand what's happening. And then you can share that with others. So it's, it, it's a more kind of a less aggressive and more maybe passive approach to doing it. You get, you get your wins and you earn the right to then go and do some other stuff. So that's kind of my feedback on yeah, that. Yeah, look, I would say in, in big global companies, multinational companies, you know, you get more processes than you can poke a stick at, yep. right? Um, so, you know, I see part of our job, leadership job, is to help the team navigate through those those internal processes, which sometimes get in the way of actually common sense and, and yep. doing business. And, and what we try and concentrate on is, in inverted commas, coalitions of the willing. Um, so in the bid team, we, we look for two or three really key people who can kind of corral that, that coalition and make sure they're pointed in the right direction and, and, and stay to true north. Um, and then I think it's management's job, leadership job, to kind of help them push through and navigate the bureaucracy or the, or, or the policies or uh, you know, some of the internal processes which cause you grief. I think that you, you can talk uh, in your organisation about it a lot and, and, and try and get that, that, that uh, mind share over time. But you can al always come in the back door as well. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, I work in recruitment. Um, it's, it's about recruiting the right people and you won't have to convince anyone if they're already on board if you've used that in your selection criteria. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to speak to the elephant in the room, I think um, only 10% of the, the room here is female. And it's an interesting observation and it's a challenge that we face every day. I think diversity in an organisation, if you're looking at your organisational EQ, um, I'm sure you would be able to speak to this, Key, and that um, some organisations have done some studies, and I know Hay Group is one of them, that proves that females on average across the board have higher EQ than us guys. Um, so look at evening up the numbers in your organisation. We're talking about culture fit to the customer. You're more likely to have that if you've got diversity in your own team, in your own selling team. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we're talking about team selling. Um, in, in that, and, you know, I think that's critical um, that you've got both sides and depending on you know, who your customer is, you've always got a seller that's going to appear. <coughs> um, and I think, you know, interestingly, we're finding only 15% of the talent that we uh, have available to us, and, and we're looking at it here in the room, is female. And we do most of our work in IT and professional services, sales recruitment. Um, but what we're actually finding is we did a study in our own database, and that women are twice as likely to be hired off the back of an interview than a man for in IT and professional services sales. So organisations are tuning into it. Um, but it's, it's, I don't know that it's only about EQ, though. It's a whole range of things driving that. But I think if we can get diversity, organisational EQ will rise. And I think diversity, as you say, it's, it's definitely gender-based, but it's also industry-based. And it's also, uh, you know, one of the big four recently said they're no longer mandating um, degrees in, um, in their, you know, people coming in because they've found that it's actually creating a, a very binary style of, of um, recruit 
and they want to get more diversity in terms of thinking as well. So I think it covers a whole lot of different bases. But yeah, I completely agree. And if, if you're hiring, you know, if you're hiring for culture and training for skills, then then you're more likely to be able to shift the um, the organizational culture quickly than individual people just trying to tinker away. But yeah. but don't be afraid to tinker away because you'll kick some goals and people will very quickly start to notice. One last question up the back. Yeah, uh, Kieran just struck yourself into your chair there because you might fall off in a moment uh, <laughs> and you'll understand why in a moment. Uh, I've managed many organizations, both locally and globally. In fact, my last role, I had five and a half thousand salespeople. Uh, and I can honestly say, Kieran, in 35 years of managing salespeople, I've never seen a summation of what needed to be successful in sales than what you've just provided today. So I'll just give you that compliment. Thank you. Yep, great. And, f and for the panel, the uh, conundrum I've always sort of, you know, tried to get in my head in the last five years in particular, is you, you talk about cultural fit and you talk about the sales world. And they're two different things, actually, in my world, right? Because a lot of organizations hire to fit the culture of the organization. But the reality of life is if you've got good salespeople 90% of the time, they're out in front of the customer, and you really need to hire for the customer, not for the organization, even though there's some intrinsic values there you need to have between the two. So for Steve, more importantly, what work do you think is being done at the moment to try and understand that front-end piece better for the customer hiring rather than the organization hiring? Because in every organ I've just come from a huge organization where Globally, they, they still talk about when hiring, they're talking about the front end and the culture of the organization, not the culture of the customer. So the question is, it, what, you know, what work's being done in that area that you're aware of? I don't know that there's a lot of uh, conscious documented work. I think there's an innate understanding as to the customer. So, for example, a lot of the organizations we uh, recruit for are uh, selling HR technology, for example. And if you look at the profile of the average HR professional making a decision on that, um, they're actually hiring um, consciously or unconsciously, I'm not sure to be honest, um, to the profile that they're, that they're selling to and, and that's quite common. Um, but I think a lot of the time um, there is uh, a culture fit is, is, uh, is about recruiting to what you've always been. So if you're happy with what you are today, keep recruiting based on culture. But if you want to change, um, you need to recruit to your customer's culture, as, as, as you say. And I think there is an over-focus on recruiting for what we are today and maintaining the status quo, cultural fit to our organisation, and, and nowhere near enough focus on what you've said. So I think it's a really valid point. Can I give you my view? Um, we we spent a lot of time at the front end getting clear on who our target market was. So we, and I'd say it's always been relatively clear, but we've, over the last couple of years we spent more and more energy really narrowing in who is a perfect fit for us. And so when you're clear on who's a perfect fit you know, in terms of a customer lens, then I think it becomes a little bit easier to recruit people in who are going to be good value for us in order, in order to serve them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to throw in a quick comment. I'm conscious of, everyone, of time here as well. There's a great quote from Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, where he talks about um, <coughs> wanting to have the customer at the centre of everything he does and keeping a, a, a chair in every meeting room empty to represent the customer. And I think that's a, that's a good concept, but I think you can actually go quite a bit further. Um, a lot of the you know, work I'll do for corporates, when we talk about the voice of the customer, I'll say, great, what customer are we going to invite in to, you know, to talk to? And they were like, oh, hang on, why, why would we do that? Because we, we can give you a sense of the voice of the customer. Why don't we just ask the customer? Because they're, usually they're more than happy to you know, contribute yep. if, you, if you're prepared to ask them. So that would be one of the things I'd say. Bring them in more frequently and have that conversation because they're really happy to to share and then we don't need to guess. Hey, can we just uh, a round of applause for uh, Steve, Tim and Kean? Awesome insights, thank you very much. I'll hand back to John.